there are obviously some risks associated with fintech. And so while fintech can make the world a better and a safer place, it doesn't come without its own risks. And so in the next session, Professor Bracken will talk about uh, and then moderate a panel on social risks associated with fintech. And those are distinct risks from, for, for example, credit and liquidity risks that we hear often in the news about. These social risks, while broad in scope and character, can be quite important and powerful. More, these social risks are often the drivers for political, regulatory, and legal actions that directly impact fintech suppliers, incumbent financial institutions, and consumers. And Paul Bracken is the professor of management and professor of political science at Yale University. He's a leading expert in global competition and the strategic application of technology in business and defense. He has been involved in several business war games of financial warfare for the Department of Defense and in corporate responses to regulatory changes like Dodd-Frank Act. A member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he serves on the Chief of Naval Operations Executive Panel and co-chairs the, uh, the Board of Advisors of the U.S. Naval War College and the Naval Postgraduate School. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, thanks. Uh, I hope, thank you all for coming up to Yale for the day. Uh, we appreciate it. It's still, we consider it a new building and we're very proud to show it off. What I'd like to do is to uh, give remarks sort of in two areas that deal with social risk. First, social risk itself uh, and, and, and sort of uh, how some examples of this play out in the world rather than trying to come up with a rigorous definition of what we mean by social risks. But the basic idea is there's, it's not to be comprehensive or to think about all these things in an integrated way as much as it is there's areas of social risk that if you touch them, you'll be, and you're a company, you'll be electrocuted, okay? You will be struck dead because of the outrage in Congress, public opinion, and other things. Uh, the second area, which is a little bit different, is what's going on in the cybersecurity space and in the cyber warfare space. And there's just a lot of interesting things that not only restricted to how the threat is evolving, but also how uh, big, sprawling, complex organizations deal with this thing and how they drive it, how they recognize risks. So let me start off with this question about social risks and give a few examples. And imagine that if I were using PowerPoint, there would be two PowerPoint slides up there, two lists. One that uh, got into the question of uh, the problem areas, so that where financial technology has created problems or contributed to problems. The second chart would be that where it has solved problems, okay? Um, and where it has uh, created problems, let me just give a few examples, I think uh, the one that comes to my mind most uh, vividly is the hack of the central bank of uh, Bangladesh, which something like $60 million, you hear different amounts of money, was lifted from the account by working through SWIFT. It is alleged in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, other sources, that it was the North Korean government that did this. Okay, and I don't know that anybody would say that this is not like a really bad thing to happen, at least outside of Kim Jong-un and his newly elevated sister, who probably think it's, it's a great thing, but most of us think it's pretty bad. Let me give another example where it's not exactly FinTech of like small, really high-tech technology, but one that I've looked at in the, if you look at the crisis in the housing market in Spain, one of the things that's really quite interesting is the way Spanish banks from about 2001 up until the crisis in 2008 were heavily invested in um, going, bringing IT into the bank to make the Spanish banking system uh, more efficient. Um, if you look at the effect of the recession on Spain and other countries, Spain was the one that got hit the hardest and it was a social impact reflected in the employment rate. Now, nobody's saying that 
just to give you some numbers, if you went back to like 19, 2008, late 2007, uh, France and Spain had about an 8% unemployment rate. In the recession at the peak, 2010, 2011, the French unemployment rate goes up to something like 12 and 13%. 13%. The Spanish unemployment rate goes to 25, 26%. The unemployment rate for youth, for young people in Spain, uh, is something like 18 to 25 has shot up to 50%. All right. Another consequence of this is that it really restructured Spanish politics so that the uh, traditional right-left divide has been replaced by new political parties, as in, as in many parts of Europe. So what effect did technology uh, have on this, this burgeoning unemployment rate? Again, I can't emphasize there's many things going on. Uh, but the, it is, the studies that I've seen indicate that what it allowed the Spanish economy to do is that the banks could channel even more money into a bloated, overinvested housing sector. And in other words, they were sort of, the new technology meant that they more efficiently driving the automobile over the cliff. All right. Now, the Spanish regulations did not recognize this at all. Uh, did not intervene in this area uh, until it was after the crisis. And, and now they're taking some actions. Uh, so this idea that, it's, that financial technology could amplify the signal, and there's positive examples, and as well as negative examples. Uh, let me just, a couple more of what I consider social risks. If you look at the Wells Fargo and the LIBOR crises, the one effect of these, it wasn't, Again, it wasn't technology per se, but it was the opacity of the systems that allowed these frauds or wrongs to go ahead. And they did have social implications, particularly for a very negative view of not just the banking sector and the public in the United States, but also uh, very negative views of big business, that it's not trustworthy. Um, and it's an anti-business attitude, which there was a confluence with other areas like bailing out the banks in the financial crisis itself some years ago that I think had negative effects. Uh, final example of social implications of, uh, it's again, technology, I would say the NSA, the National Security Agency, um, the exposés of Edward Snowden have created enormous concerns uh, and some regulation and attempt to get at this question about protecting individual privacy, to have due process installed, and also to make sure that there's not a massive surveillance program that is uh, going out of control. So we could give other examples, but that's a good way to, uh, to sort of start. What would be on the second chart? Uh, more efficient capital al al allocation microcredit lending uh, came up this morning, credits given to small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, that's clearly a good thing. A lot of studies have shown, uh, there's an interesting financial stabil uh, stability board study that came out in August, and they talked about the huge uh, gaps, that how expensive it is to transfer remittances cross-border that the worldwide, advertising, the worldwide average to send $200 cross-border, and this would be like immigrants in one country sending money to their families in another, was uh, to me an astounding 7.4% you had to pay for this. So there's real possibilities and many good things, and many of these have uh, come up in the morning. Uh, I would also put in this column uh, counter, going after counterterrorism funding um, as a good thing. So NSA sort of makes it into the bad column and also into the good column because they have really done a significantly improved job going after uh, terrorist funding. Okay, I want to come back to this uh, sort of the good chart, the problems chart, and the bad chart and suggest what this might mean for uh, leadership uh, as Steve Daffron was sort of introducing the subject this morning. But let me first turn to a sort of quick 
capsule summary of what's been going on in cybersecurity. And really, a tremendous amount has been going on. We read about the hacks, OK? But in cybersecurity, what you have, uh, the big picture issues that I would point to is the diversification of the threat in the following way. That the nation states around the world, almost any serious country today, has a major cyber warfare program to watch their enemies, to do things that their intelligence services uh, want to do and that their leaders tell them to do. Um, and also to harden their own systems against attacks. Uh, this is kind of obvious, but it's very troubling because uh, it's very, and directly out of today's uh, headlines, if you think about it, as recently as the late 1990s, uh, when it came to either nuclear weapons and now cyber weapons, uh, there was a monopoly over both of these technologies by major countries. United States, Russia, to some extent, China. And now, with the spread of nuclear weapons to North Korea, the debate about Iran, et cetera. But what I want to touch on here is the spread of cyber forces that can, can do all sorts of things, like attack the, uh, the Sony Corporation, that can attack the uh, Central Bank of Bangladesh. Uh, the innovation that is always going on in the minds of intelligence services and leaders in other countries has a whole new sandbox to play on. Now, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but if it's our best estimate that how, in particular, some countries run their cyber programs um, is with something that looked really close to what Queen Elizabeth had uh, back in her day in the Elizabethan era, and that's privateers which is that the people who work for some of these cyber warfare agencies in Russia, China, and other countries, they get paid a salary, but they also get paid in that they get access to the technology and they get access to doing what they want to do on their own uh, in the after hours. They can moonlight and go, go after the banking system of somebody. So it's, there's not even, not only is it's, is the, are these technologies spreading, there's a decentralization to them. This makes um, efforts to try to deter this effort extremely difficult to do. And the Department of Defense and the intelligence community have run a number of uh, war games on this very topic. And so what comes out of it is the difficulty of deterring things. The deterrence might have worked, in the, well, it did work in the Cold War, but it's seemingly uh, unlikely to work in this area because of the uh, decentralization and the large number of countries. We're not just dealing with one uh, giant country. Okay, so what is, uh, what, how can we sort of use this, this environmental scan, if you will, that I've been talking about um, in a productive way to get at this question of changing the world in a positive way. OK, uh, I would argue a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, there's, an, uh, there's a methodology, somewhat obscure. Uh, it's more like a framework than a methodology in the Defense Department many, many years ago. And it was called NET assessment, N-E-T-A-S-S-E-S-S-S-M-E-N-T. -S -S uh, basically, what net assessment makes a couple of assumptions about how you look at a really big, complicated problem. First of all, it says that the way you look at a problem over longer periods of time make it look very different than if you looked at it for short periods of time. The second thing is that it says most big problems of this character are factored into individual parts by sprawling organizations and their departments. OK, so you see like in cybersecurity, who's responsible for it in the United States? Whatever algorithm or hardening of the system you come up with, the, one of the really big issues that th that would not address is how you can make sure that like uh, the private banking system, who is, does the government have responsibilities for that? Uh, who protects government circuits? Who prevents private communication circuits? 
who prevents, who protects the power system and all. And this is an example of factoring the problem. So one sort of uh, suggestion, I think is the best term to describe this, is to kind of look at net assessment as a framework because net, the, the core problem, we could all continue the list of problems that financial technology could lead to. And then we could counter that with largely unrelated examples of good things that it does. But sort of that assessment looks at this and says, well, the whole core of the problem you're facing is how to balance the bads with the goods. How do you make a, quote, net assessment of what public policy should be and what government uh, rules and regulations should be? So one thing I would say is that net assessment has a lot of uh, practical use that it could help us think through some of these problems. Uh, in the area of cybersecurity and in regulation, there's a particular aspect of net assessment when they say they look at it over the, wrong, the long term. It seems to me that's especially important for financial issues because the problems that financial technology will lead to in the short term uh, will be quite different than over the whole business cycle that it's when, the, it's when the economy turns down um, and the growth rates are lowered and maybe leverage is increased, maybe there's inflation, that if you just look at this as a snapshot of solving 2017 problems, uh, you're likely to miss the, the larger implications of these technologies, which play out over the longer term. OK. Um, Let's look at the cyber warfare, cyber security problem, and um, a couple of things come out of this, it seems to me, that are useful areas to explore. First of all, when I look around uh, at what the needs are in this area, it is overwhelmingly people who can integrate things, factor them into large organizations. So we need people that look at it from the tech point of view and the, the algorithmic point of view, but getting a big sprawling organization to integrate its different parts is something that I think business schools, think tanks, consulting firms uh, really can help out on. Uh, and it really is, a, it is the tremendous need. You may have seen in the newspapers that the National Security Agency, the NSA, uh, has a separate group called Cyber Command uh, which is a unified and specified command. It was just promoted to that status. And what's going on there is that when you have an intelligence agency like NSA, it can't well integrate with the operational armed forces. Cyber Command is a combatant command. It can integrate directly with the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. And that's a good example of teaching people how to do that. GE is trying to do that with the Internet of Things now to introduce these very advanced technologies, AI, big data, and things across all of their divisions, which are in very different businesses. Like many years ago, this would be called systems integration and such. Uh, but it's really uh, a, an incredible need. And I think the first school or think tank that really tries to do some work in this area could really do the country and the world a uh, great deal of service. And I guess my last recommendation would be this, that um, I've been involved with several uh, war games um, in which these problems were tackled. What is a war game? War game is simply a role-playing simulation. We have different teams, and one team might play China, one team might play the United States. Uh, I was involved in one game by a, a large global service advisory company that looked at how Dodd-Frank would affect them and their client base. And so the teams were this particular firm, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Fed, Justice Department, and four or five teams representing key client groups played by employees of the organization that was doing the game. And I've done a lot of work over the years with Tom Schelling for the Defense Department. And I think both of us are struck that in, when you do these role-playing simulations, this is not game theory. This is role-playing simulations. You get tremendous amounts of insight that you never would have thought of before. 
uh, that come out of the exercise of what the problems are. Uh, so those are some thoughts. I don't, do we have time for any questions or we have two minutes? Any questions or comments or stuff like that for anything I may have said? Oh, okay, sure. The question was around game theory, and I'm sorry, uh, war games, right. and uh, uh, Philip Tetlock's research on super forecasters and how you could train certain individuals to become much better at forecasting. I'd be just curious about these games that you okay, mentioned. Okay, the question is, uh, Phil, it's Phil, I think, Tetlock, isn't it? Yeah. Right, he's at Wharton now. Uh, anyway, he, his argument is that you can, you can educate people to be better forecasters, and I think that's a terrific thing. We should all do that. But there's other approaches to risk management. Okay, there's breaking a big problem into smaller problems. There's having a strong balance sheet. Uh, there's working with alliances. There's shaping the environment. If you look at the accounting firms, what they're doing around the world, the big four accounting firms, they're trying to shape the legal business environment in the different countries they operate in, which is everywhere, uh, to be less litigious, to prevent uh, class action lawsuits. And so this isn't really prediction. It's a different way to attack the risk problem. And then the, problem, the challenge for a company becomes which of these various ways, better prediction perhaps, or shaping the environment, or strengthening the balance sheet and reserves, buying insurance is another way. So I think we need to, I, I would suggest looking at prediction as one and only one way to deal with risk and uncertainty. And could I ask my panelists to come up and... Uh, to continue the conversation. We have a uh, terrific panel for you. Why don't you just sit in any order? Yes, sit in, okay. Um, Jeff Bandeman is uh, with us from Bandeman Advisors. Jeff worked at the Commodity Future Trading Corporation. Dave Pogmiller is a VP for strategy for Red Owl. Red Owl is a company that does, uh, it protects and monitors the digital activity of companies. Uh, Sunil is at Socure, which is an identity management company, okay? Uh, and Michelle Tuvason is at uh, Cambridge University Judge School Center for Risk Studies and do does uh, a lot of multi-client studies mm for different aspects of risk. And it'll be interesting to get Michelle's view on uh, what, what are clients worried about these days? What are companies worried about? And so what I think I'd like to ask each one, each of our panelists, maybe starting with Michelle, if you could describe maybe in just a couple of minutes what you see, what your cognitive map of this uh, sprawling subject of broad social risks and FinTech uh, was about. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you. Pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, so based on my affiliation, uh, you can probably imagine I'll bring the risk perspective to the discussion. We've heard a lot about the opportunities um, earlier today. Um, so one of the things that we have done at the center is we have come up working with business and the clients that, um, that we work with a holistic framework for looking at risks. So uh, companies and organizations tend to think of risks, risk du jour, what's, what's in the news, what's in the consciousness. But coming up a framework that looks at um, holistic uh, risks off balance sheets, so not just financial risks, and to do uh, more of a uh, methodological uh, analysis on, on their business and um, on the economy, on what different risks and what kind of impacts that they can have. Um, a subset of the group we work with are chief risk officers at um, some of the global banks. And uh, oftentimes we have um, closed session roundtable discussions on what kind of emerging risks really keep them up at night. And we recently had one on FinTech. And so that under Chatham House rules, they're able to discuss um, things that are on their mind that might, uh, they might not say publicly. Um, the, the biggest uh, argument that that we're hearing is that although FinTech is, is very exciting and it rep represents a lot of opportunity, um, at the end of the day, 
these, co these fintech company, the industries, are relying on the traditional banking sector to do all the back end um, processing, so to speak, to integrate with the regulators, to respond to regulation, and ultimately be accountable. And so um, that, that disparity um, needs to come together to fin for fintech to really be a, uh, a viable solution going forward. Good. Uh, Jeff, do you want to take a crack at this? Yeah, sure. Overview? Uh, yeah, thanks. I really, really enjoyed your, uh, your introduction to this. You know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a broad topic, and in kind of thinking about where to start, you know, from my own experience, um, it's where, where we all begin. Uh, you know, I recently was a regulator and actually had a couple of different uh, roles there. I spent a period actually running the CFTC's Division of Clearing and Risk, overseeing market infrastructure. Uh, but then, uh, while in that role, uh, we started to monitor uh, developments in uh, blockchain and ledger technology. Uh, because it seemed like one of the first areas that it might disrupt was uh, clearing and settlement. And then went on from there um, <clears throat> to uh, actually found the uh, first uh, kind of government innovation lab, uh, U.S. government federal innovation lab, uh, lab CFTC, so that uh, the regulators could hear uh, more directly from innovators as well as uh, start to use that technology themselves. And, and I guess to try to start to tackle the, the questions that Paul has put in front of us, you know, I would maybe uh, focus on uh, two of them. One of them, uh, from the perspective of a former, uh, former regulator, is, you know, is fintech actually going to equip regulators to put them in a position to do a better job to help address uh, some of these uh, social issues? And, you know, when you say uh, what risks has uh, fintech created or solved, who's going to solve them? Is it going to be the industry? Is it going to be people in general? Is it going to be the regulators or some, some combination of all of them? And I think to solve problems, we will need uh, all of them. So one, one area that I think that um, fintech can help, I, don't say, I wouldn't say we're there today, ha has to do with sort of the data and tools that, that put problem solvers in a position to, to solve problems. And that's where I think uh, the technology of blockchain and uh, distributed ledger technology has, has really, really exciting, potentially transformational promise. So today, when, when regulators, uh, you know, supervisors, central bankers get information, you know, it might be the day after something occurred, it might be the end of a quarter, it might be the end of the year, but, but you know, they're, they're looking at things in, in the rearview mirror. I think the intelligence community is watching things mostly as they unfold, but other, other regulators are getting things in the past. But one of the things the distributed ledger does, as events occur, that information is recorded on the ledger, and because there can be regulator nodes or auditor nodes, the regulator can actually see these things as they take place and start to monitor them in real time. So this would be a transformational opportunity if there are unfair or deceptive practices, if there are social ills, if there are buildups of risk, to be able to actually see these things as they are occurring instead of long afterwards. That's a really transformational opportunity. And so I think you know we're not there. We need to learn how to you know, understand that data, develop the, the tools to do it. We may even need uh, new skills or new people to start to help do that. But I think that's a real avenue where FinTech can actually lead to helping to uh, solve the, uh, the problems. Um, and if Great. I time to, add, sure. time, yeah. time to add one more. So, you know, Sally in, in the earlier panel commented on, um, <clears throat> and I agreed in part and I guess disagreed in part when she said that banks were technology companies. And I think at a certain level that's right at the time. I was working in a clearinghouse, and a clearinghouse is a technology company in the sense that, you know, any of these businesses that serve the financial markets are clearly, you know, using technology to solve these, these issues. But um, the, the, you know, the, even though these large financial institutions are engaging with innovation, some of them are starting up incubators, uh, you know, they also are making it harder and harder to actually introduce or adopt new technologies and new services in, in their organizations. Um, I was at a conference uh, earlier th uh, this summer uh, focusing on operational risk. And it turned out one of the largest banks now has a person that's actually called Chief Third-Party Vendor Management Officer. Now, why is that relevant at a conference like this? Why are we talking about vendor management? The point is this very large bank was trying to get the number of third-party vendors down from something like 80,000 to in the neighborhood of five to 7,000. Now, what is a vendor? A vendor is a startup technology company or a mature technology company that's providing services in there. So in fact, even though we're in this wave of innovation, 
the organizations that are most in need of it are in the hardest position because they are trying to reduce the number of uh, innovators, uh, of vendors that they use. And then when I asked, well, how do you decide which ones to use? They said, well, we have a risk-based framework. So if it's highly risky and it's really core to the mission of the bank, you know, it's very, very difficult. But, you know, if it helps us use PowerPoint slides in a, in a you know, more convenient way, that stuff can get into the bank much more easily. So I kind of think they've got those priorities backwards. But so I think we've got, you know, needs, but I think there are also challenges to adoption of these technologies. Great. David, do you want to take a shot at this? Sure. So uh, a little bit about my background. So I started out in economics around the time that the financial, uh, the Asian financial crisis around 1998. Uh, I was at Moody's uh, during the mortgage crisis. Uh, and then I've moved into sort of cybersecurity. And, and so when I think about what fintech is, is doing and some of the you know, uh, risks that it poses, is I think about the technology being able to do a lot of very good things, broadening the base of who can get lending and access to funding and reducing a lot of the friction. And then, you know, Paul mentioned before the, the, the impact in Spain of, of technology sort of accelerating the irrational exuberance of, of people getting into, into mortgages. And so when I think about this, I think about it as a very sort of human problem where we're, we're actually exposing people to uh, additional risks and an ability to do things that otherwise they may not want to do uh, or just to make bad, bad decisions. So when we think about protecting uh, people's data, when we think about trying to stop the next Snowden or the next insider trader, you know, uh, I've been talking a lot about, you know, there's good people, there's tempted people, and there's bad people in every organization, right? And so how do you think about people going from good to bad? And so there's uh, a Nobel laureate, Gary Becker, who talked a lot about criminals doing sort of a utility function of saying, look, ultimately doing this, this criminal activity or this risky thing has a higher value to me than going and working at, at McDonald's, right? And so the really interesting thing is to me is, is that Richard Thaler just won uh, the Nobel laureate, and, and so he talks a lot about nudging, right? And so as, as I think about this very human problem and I think about all these different opportunities for fintech organizations to help accelerate people, I also think about the opportunity for, one, their privacy to be increasingly at risk, and then two, as an adjunct to that, the potential for sort of the misuse of, of nudging, of saying we now know all of this information about these people, can I nudge them to do something that I want them to, to do, and that could be a corporation who's, who's uh, being a little overly aggressive, or frankly, that could be a bad actor who, who uh, you know, somebody who would be floating around the dark web and, and, and trying to solicit uh, people through social engineering, et cetera. There's, there's increasing risk there, and I, and I think that's probably a, uh, a good dovetail into to Sunil. Sunil? Thank you. Um, a wee bit of background myself. Um, I've spent about uh, 23 years in uh, the security identity and access management industry. Um, and I know most of the panel here and Paul has basically looked at this from kind of a cybersecurity perspective. Um, I kind of have a different perspective. I think that FinTech is a new term. Uh, financial institutions have always uh, used technology to push the envelope uh, of what they can, the value they can deliver. And ultimately FinTech uh, innovation is driven by consumer adoption. Uh, no financial institution or any institution for that matter uh, can try to shove something into the face of the consumer that the consumer does not want to accept. Um, so, you know, when you look at crime generally, any type of crime has motive, means, and opportunity. And two of those things are always true. That is, the motive is that you can end up with money um, through fraud or some uh, you know, kind of advantage through cybercrime or state, state uh, actors uh, committing crime. Um, the means in terms of exploiting technological complexity, that's a, that's a given too. Um, so what you're really left with is opportunity. And it's an interesting thing that anyone given the opportunity to commit crime and to commit things like fraud, for example, given the right circumstances, will actually commit that crime. And if you don't believe me, um, consider the scenario of you, each of you walking down the street um, and seeing an ATM 
uh, that was malfunctioning and chucking money into the street. Uh, how many of you would stop to take that money and stick it in your bags and keep walking versus going into the bank to let them know that there's an ATM malfunction? So that's kind of... You, you, you know, can raise your hands for this uh, quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you know where that ATM... The police will be here shortly. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the point is that fraud is the normal. Um, there are risks that are the normal uh, that exists in the world, and you know some of those risks have been exacerbated uh, by the pace of adoption of technology. But in the financial technology world, in the, in the financial world generally, uh, there's very little disruption because, well, you know, you can talk about blockchain and stuff till the cows come home. But you know, adoption in uh, large enterprises that are operating on uh, risk-averse business models and revenue preservation business models tends not to happen. Uh, change tends to happen in nudges, in small, small steps. Um, so generally, I think uh, you know, fintech uh, evolution has helped the world. And just the nature of technology and the different types of risks that exist in, in using technology, uh, that's kind of remained constant in a way. Um, so I, I don't think that the innovations we're seeing today are, are any worse than the innovations we'd have seen you know, 20 years ago. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, when you think about when credit models were first created for lending, right, um, you could say that th that had a negative impact because it disenfranchised people who were living on cash. It still continues to do that. Five billion people in the world live on cash. Credit is only available in 14 countries in the world. So um, I see both, you know, kind of positive, uh, the positive side to this more, I suppose, than the negative. Um, obviously, when you look at it from the the lens of cybercrime, yeah, it, you know, it can it can look pretty gnarly, um, but in the company that I'm in right now, the, that I've started, called Secure, we actually look at a different side of uh, financial risk, um, the business to consumer risk, um, and acceptance of good customers, uh, reduction of fraud, uh, reduction of cost through uh, automation. So it's kind of a different focus or a different spin um, on the, the types of risks that we deal with and that we help uh, financial institutions with uh, that are actually genuine problems. Um, accepting people today is a big problem for not just financial institutions, but for every business. Every business needs to improve top-line revenue. And we are seeing a shift in demographics uh, in favor of millennials, 18 to 34-year-olds, uh, who've fundamentally moved away from credit behaviors. Uh, millennials and the rest of us today live in a world uh, that's a shared market economy. People are not buying cars, they're driving around in Ubers. They're not buying homes, they're staying at home with mom and dad paying off student loans. Uh, they're not spending money on credit cards, they're spending money on debit cards. Um, so there's an entire population of people. In fact, 18 to uh, 34 year olds are poised to be 80% of the US workforce in the next three years. Um, and all of those people are excluded from the uh, traditional uh, uh, fintech world uh, because the infrastructure to support, which is a credit bureau infrastructure, doesn't cover those people. And while all of us are talking about Equifax and the data breaches and stuff, uh, Equifax's breach is the 23rd breach this year. As of last year, six times the US population's data has already been stolen. So if you take the, the change in demographics and the ease of availability of data uh, as two vectors, you can imagine the types of risks that financial institutions and other companies uh, generally face today uh, in the landscape. Can I ask Jeff to come in on this point? Because what I heard you was saying was that it's a very legitimate uh, and maybe even uncontroversial role for federal regulators uh, to at least monitor the trends Sunil and others were talking about to find out if there is a problem there in the first place. Yeah, okay? that, well, I'm asking uh, Jeff. You sure. Well, did you want to add something yeah, to respond I, to that? Sure. You know, uh, I think I spoke yeah. about this uh, at no, another conference recently, right? Um, there's a big modality in terms of how compliance and regulation works, and uh, a difference in modality between how compliance and regulation works in the United States versus other countries in the world. Uh, in Europe and other developing countries, there's a forward-leaning posture for regula regulatory compliance. That is, regulators think through the problem, then they dictate the, the compliance rules, and then people adopt. Uh, in the US, we tend to favor innovation over regulation, and uh, therefore, regulation lags behind adoption. So the consequence of yeah. that is that you know, we'll adopt technology, and that'll cause some heartburn, it'll cause a lot of fires here and there, and then we'll figure out 
what 40% of the market ends up adopting, and that becomes a regulation. So, so, so yeah, so I, I think that, um, I think regulators are, um, you know, really uh, tackling the, these types of issues uh, he head on, and, and uh, you know, to set up my former agency at the, the CFTC, uh, you know, we, we set up a dedicated function in order to, uh, you know, we started monitoring uh, evolving technologies, uh, you know, as, as soon as we really detected them and saw, thought we saw impacts there. And, you know, I had colleagues at every federal agency who were looking at these types of issues and, and, and state, state agencies as well and others are around the world. And, you know, I think some, some of the uh, regulatory initiatives around the world, you know, get a lot of hype. They have cool names like, you know, they're a sandbox or they're an accelerator or they're a launch pad. Good names. But, you know, I, th I think that, and, and there's a lot of great, great substance and great people working on them. But I think that the, the U.S. regulators are, are, you know, are taking these, these types of issues very seriously. But, the, you know, a couple of the challenges, um, you know, one is your, your, you know, the mission of, of the regulator, you know, is, is really constant. And, you know, a lot of your uh, mission is, uh, you know, it's not just to create these kind of moats or walls that, that people were talking about earlier, but, you know, you're there for, uh, you know, customer, customer protection or investor protection or to protect against unfair, deceptive, discriminatory lending practices. And so, you know, as these, these issues come up, you know, it's, it's a challenging, challenging position because, you know, you, you are aware that there's a, a public trust. And, you know, somebody, you know, as, as we at the CFTC, you know, started to come in and people would meet with us and it was anybody from, you know, the largest exchanges and clearing houses and banks in the world, many of which have been named today, and literally, you know, you'd have a guy in a hoodie from Greenpoint come in and say, hey, here's this thing that I've, that I've built. And so, you know, it's great that they're engaging with, with the regulators, and then you start to think, gee, yeah, it'd be nice, nice to let this person, you know, nice for this person to go on. But then there's kind of a customer impact because these, these technologies, uh, you know, can have such an impact so quickly and harm so many people, and you say, you know, if we wouldn't let, you know, one of the most robust, you know, uh, exchange groups in the world that has financial resources to compensate people who it's harms do something, you know, why should we let somebody just because they're sort of a cool innovator from, you know, one of those people from the from one of the counties that was shown on the uh, on the cube? So that, you know, that that is one of the the challenges. And, you know, there there was discussion earlier today around, uh, you know, I think an important you know fintech initiative, which is these token sales or, or you know, ICE initial coin, right. coin offerings. Um, you know, there was a question earlier about the, uh, the DAO uh, 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 um, venture capital fund and, and, and the hack, which is, I think, a fascinating topic. But, you know, I, I think the, the SEC has been, you know, they're sort of in, in the middle of this. I mean, some of these things are securities, some of them are not. It was actually uh, their investor advisory group yesterday was, was studying this issue, and I went down and kind of met with them and some other kind of blockchain folks talk to them in a public, public hearing, I think the SEC is actually doing uh, something very constructive. They um, did a bit of a wait and see. Uh, in July, they put out a report uh, that, that said, okay, many of these are securities. This, we're going to look at substance over form. The same test that we've been using for all sorts of other kinds of things that people have come up with in financial innovation over the last 70 years, this exact same test applies. And so it moves things in an arc towards greater legal certainty. But, you know, these, these, uh, these coin offerings and token sales, I mean, it, it's, it's a transformational opportunity for all sorts of innovators to sort of monetize projects at a much earlier stage without going to venture capitalists, without going to, to crowdfunding. And, you know, in 2017, two and a quarter billion dollars has been raised through these, through these things. And just in the last two months, since the SEC drew a line in the sand and said some of these are securities, be careful, 900, uh, yeah, 900 million has been raised in these, in these things. So it's having a big effect. David, do you want to come in on this? Because uh, it seemed to me you were saying there's, there's good people and bad people. And I had this image of a normal distribution that's, un, <laughs> that's fixed, you know, and what good or bad. But the discussion points out that it's the interaction of a certain environment with some predispositions, perhaps. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's right. So um, <laughs> I think it's funny to think about your example. I, I, I don't think I'd pick the ATM, uh, take the money from it. 
<laughs> but um, you know, when you think about when you think about uh, who's in an organization and, and who's sort of in the world, like you do, think that most everybody is bad, which which Sunil sort of does. Uh, I, I don't I don't I don't see it as black and white. Yeah. If you were homeless and you hadn't fed yourself and you walked by, by that ATM, you might actually take that money. No, no, that's right. so I totally agree with that. And so when you think about this, is what Becker talks about in this utility function is you know, and I boil it down typically to you know what's the cost of you getting caught. Um, meaning, do you go to jail? Is there a fine? Do you lose your career? Do you lose your, your family, et cetera? What's the risk of you getting caught, right? Uh, what's the value of you actually taking that action, whether it's like a personal motive and, hey, I've gotten back at the government because I've stolen all this stuff from them and, or if I'm going to make a lot of money from it. Um, and so, and so that's, that's what a lot of folks are trying to do on any given day is, is just make those decisions, right? And so um, that's why I thought Thaler winning was really important because you've got this opportunity as, as an organization or organizations and, and now with fintechs to uh, help people make better decisions on an ongoing basis, sure. right? Um, and so when you talk about the, the impact on society from fintechs, I think there's a real consideration for how are organizations approaching what they're delivering and, and what they're trying to give to consumers. Uh, and then there's a really interesting discussion around how much regulation do you need versus how well are you thinking through actually how people behave, what they're actually like, and can I uh, either obviate the need for regulation, can I delay the need for regulation, or do I need to come in in advance and, and do it? And that sort of all gets back to when you think through, if you think of like a risk-based framework, like, am I going to have a black swan event with the mortgage crisis because everybody is going in there and, and engaging in this rational exuberance, or is it a smaller, more contained thing where, uh, where I can assume more risk for, for the organization, for the country, uh, or more broadly, right? So, so, so I mean, so, so that raises an interesting point. And in to, to what extent is our kind of framework equipped for that, and to which, to what extent is, is it not? And so, you know, I referred a moment ago to the test that the SEC uses to determine whether or not something is a security, and it originated, you know, 70 plus years ago, and it involved a sale of an interest in orange groves in Florida. So that was, you know, but the point is, you know, many of these frameworks were put in place, you know, human nature, you know, the fraudsters are still around. There were people with clever frauds 50 years ago. I don't know how many years ago Ponzi was, 75 or 100, but just that's a name, but there were Ponzi schemes before. They'll be there in the future. Right. So, you know, for uh, one of our, our objectives at, at the CFTC when we set up Lab CFTC was to have a bit of a crowdsourcing function to figure out which, which of the rules and standards and, and functions that we mm. had, you know, needed to be changed and which ones um, you know, were, were fine as they were. And I say it was crowdsourcing in the sense that you know, as innovators would come in and, and, and talk to the agency about you know, rules that they were bumping up against, you know, if, if, if as a regulator you look at all the things you do and you just try to come up with it yourself kind of from an ivory tower approach, you, know, you might identify some things and it would take you a long time to do it. Engaging with the innovators, and hearing, you know, or entrepreneurs like Sunil come in and saying, well, this thing is a real problem or this framework doesn't make sense, you kind of crowdsource by having engaging so you find out, you know, which are posing the most obstacles and yeah. which are in need of attention. Um, and I think that's I'd really... I'd like to add to oh, the, um, your comment about the individual. So I guess some can argue that um, financial services sort of been lagging adopters of technology. I mean, when you compare it to other sectors, yes. such as defense, um, retail, and entertainment even. Um, so if I can draw upon um, some work that I'm doing for the IEEE, and an analogy there is looking at greater automation and, and artificial intelligence, and the kind of general principles guiding that development. I think there are a lot of parallels. And I was, I was surprised. I haven't heard the word ethics mentioned today. I was surprised with this committee that uh, there, there isn't a board or an organization or initiative really looking at the overall ethics of design of automation, greater automation and um, artificial intelligence. What are the guiding principles when you, when you design these systems as either a technology provider or adopter? And um, so an example is it, these self-driving cars, when they're de de 
any individual have an opportunity to say, I, I actually don't want a self-driving car driving next to me. Um, what what uh, contribution or influence does the individual have in society for these kinds of decisions? Um, same thing in tech that you raised. Um, these you know, various features that are going to be either used um, on your behalf or that you have the option of using. So where does the individual come into play in terms of um, these options? Yeah, and I would add, we had a really nice conversation at, uh, at lunch uh, where, and you brought up millennials earlier, one of the big things uh, that scares me quite a bit, uh, and I have three young kids, so I, I feel this very acutely, is, is uh, it feels like society is largely uh, giving away your, their privacy, right? In, in a very uninformed way, right? I don't think they're giving away. <laughs> well, they have given away. They, well, sure, they have given away, and, and then they increasingly do it, right? Distinction yeah. noted. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, the uh, access to a lot of what FinTech is doing, so if you think about mobile payments, if you think about um, that phone in your hand, it's a very, very personal connection to that. You've got... Uh, so the, the organization has so much information about you, where you are, how you, you know, what you like, what you don't like, in such a capacity to use it. And then, you know, back to this sort of idea of nudging, and I, and I think in marketing and sales, people have known this for so long on how to sort of manipulate you. I can just imagine my kids being bombarded by, it probably won't even be a phone, who knows what it's going to be, but on their phone, these things that are getting them to say, okay, well, just spend an extra $5 on this, just do an extra $10 on this. And it becomes so powerful because of that intimate knowledge that that, that organization has about you. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, again, depending on the, the market, um, regulation comes to bear. So if you look at GDPR in Europe, one of the most stringent privacy regulations in the whole world to date, uh, which if you fail the test in one of 27 countries, your company can be fined by seven times its global revenues, so it's pretty serious. Um, I think those type of regulations and that type of maturity uh, on the on the compliance side is going to find its way into our market. Well, I think, uh, yeah. You know, uh, I think that's back to the point of like global regulation as well, where that's right. there's uh, it's sort of analogous to California setting the standard for emissions for cars, right? Sure. I think GDPR is whether it's exactly right or or not is just a good example of something that will come to America sooner Michelle, rather than later. Michelle, I'd like later. to ask you uh, just a question, then like to open it up for the audience, and maybe you'll think about your questions. Um, given the conversation so far, do, you, do the private sector companies, not the governments that you work with, are they too focused on sort of operational issues of installing this stuff and protecting the obvious risks and not thinking ahead of either the debt it, it generates or the pressure it will gener put on government one or two years down the road or sort of broader issues in, in favor of like an overwhelming emphasis on, on the urgent issues of development and deployment. I'm just curious. Yeah, so um, I, one sector we've worked quite a lot with is the insurance sector. So uh, of course they're very motivated to know um, how, how does risk affect their books, their portfolios, the companies whom they insure, and um, these kinds of new emerging risks. So uh, a lot of the natural catastrophes and things that they, that's very much in their space and um, well understood. Um, cybersecurity is, is one area that is not well understood, and we did the first report with Lloyd's as part of their innovation series back in 2014, and we did a systemic study of a systemic cyber event. And when, when the study came out, we came up with total um, GDP at risk numbers. Um, people really didn't believe it because at that time, the, the world really hadn't seen a cyber, systemic cybersecurity. Now we've, we've seen many to um, complement those concerns. All right, good. So, I, I sure. just add one uh, to, to, to add on that. So um, the, um, I, I spend a lot of time now with kind of innovators and startups, maybe not quite as much time as Steve Daffron does, but a lot. And you know, just a constant joke is that uh, you know, any, but people will come up with companies that are about protecting people's privacy and business models, and the joke is that consumers will always choose convenience over That's privacy. Right. They will always choose convenience over privacy, 
and you know you do it all the time. You click things and agree to things because you just want your app to load faster or the page to come up or you want to see the thing. So uh, you know that that is just hum human nature. Uh, disclosing that you're going to do something with their imprint isn't a deterrent for people. So uh, there's been a couple of references by, by everybody else on the panel to GDPR just to explain what that is. It's a, a European law that's taking effect uh, early next year, general data privacy regulation. In Europe, regulation actually means a law that applies to all of the countries that are in the EU and actually will still apply even to the UK until they exit. So they've, they've created a privacy regime to protect consumer data uh, because they've recognized that the consumers won't do it themselves and they lack the power, uh, you know, even collectively vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, these big, these big tech companies. I actually think it's very important. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this kind of thing does come to the U.S. I think maybe the Equifax uh, breach, uh, you know, that may finally be the catalyst that, that you know, drives us towards greater sort of self-sovereignty of our own data. And I think that blockchain and some of these other technologies will empower that. So I think that's a direction that we could go where fintech could get us there. But I think that realistically people don't, you know, the consumer will, will select convenience over privacy. Good. Uh, let me see if you guys have any questions for our panelists on the issues raised or other ones. I would ask you to wait till the microphone comes around. And uh, go ahead. So yeah. Paul, I actually yeah. have, have a question I think directed back at you. So this topic um, is broad social risks. You made the point in your opening remarks. First of all, you gave a really good example about the destabilization of the, basically, the Spanish political system. You also made a comment from the point of view internal within, within organizations of risk management kind of longer term, smoothing out the short term amplitudes, if you will. But it seems to me that some of what we're talking about, the amplitude and the rapidity of some of these um, events, has the longer term potential of really destabilizing, you know, certain social aspects and certainly political. You know, we, we can look at, you know, income gap, uh, opportunity gap. But if you look at the impact, for example, of the Great Recession on <clears throat> younger generations, they're not saving, they're not investing long term when, when just, you know, they, they should. Um, so, you know, very short term extreme events, it seems to me, can have far greater, longer impacts that right. I think we all and need some to look through. The panelists may come in on this, but just I'm, a couple of things. If you look at the effect of the financial crisis on Spain, new parties came up. What really happened? Spanish politics since Franco had been divided between the right and the left, going back and forth, center right, center left. After the financial crisis, Spanish politics was turned upside down to become the young versus the old. The best predictor of who you're going to vote for is your age. And that really was new. Let me give another example of this going on in China with the incredible growth and changes there. We have one of the most eminent China scholars now retired here at Yale, Jonathan Spence, who's written uh, like 15 books. Let me summarize them all in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Professors are useful for this. Uh, many people, have, many countries have come to China to change China. They've all failed. China has changed them more than they changed China. The new work that is coming out saying there really is a new force that's coming to China that will change China, and it's called business. All right? Because business is dramatically tra changing China in all kinds of ways which are comparable to the way Spain was changed. Uh, they're making a huge investment in financial services technology excluding the American firms. I don't know where this is going to go, but it's another example of exactly of your point. These have very long-term consequences. And there's a confluence. It's not all technology. I don't know. Any of you guys want to come in on this? Yeah. Uh, machine learning is eating the world. And it is displacing people, young people and old, um, across every uh, sector from unskilled to skilled labor. So in our future, as the adoption of machine learning grows, and it will because robots are cheaper than people always, um, you know, we're, gonna look, we're gonna look at mass unemployment. And you know, I know various countries now are working on newer economic models like basic income. Um, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> this, I think this is a constant evolution, right? 
um, we will have to redefine what a job means in the future. I just wanted to add um, one thing about kind of the center movements and bringing up the example of Occupy Wall Street. So um, a business asked us, what, what would be the business impact of a social unrest event? So we did a study. And uh, we pick, picked that particular event to see what were the drivers. So age was very much a driver of the population. But secondly, it was social media, the ability to connect. And so it, it was probably one of the, uh, the first protest movements where 950 cities in a single day all came together to protest. And that kind of power that technology has given. Yeah, good well, example. Yeah. I think cause and effect, right? Um, if the financial market crisis didn't happen, the housing market crisis didn't happen, then it wouldn't have disenfranchised a lot of people. Yeah, but I mean just the concept. That, that's okay, but other questions? Well, in the absence of a question, uh, do we have one? Go ahead, and then we'll take your. I was going to say, just to follow up on what was commented. So, um, you know, in, in China, um, you know, you have these entities which really, instead of fintechs, are what people refer to as tech fins. Uh, so, technology companies that have moved into financial services. And while people here kind of speculate, what if the big, you know, Facebook and Google, whatever, did it? In China, uh, you know, companies, you know, kind of the Tencent and Alibaba with uh, Alipay and some of these have very firmly moved and become very quickly dominant. You know, WeChat, which is a chat function, is one of the primary primary ways in which uh, Chinese people, at, at enormous scale, with with some of the fastest growth ever occurred by any company, are experiencing these things. And so, you know, you have kind of a reversal of you know where kind of companies start in technology and move into financial services now and then when they make you know lending decisions right imagine if if the whoever's deciding whether to make you a loan they are already they see you know what inventory you ship how long it sits how many how many returns you get they can also go kind of check the police database to find out if you really are you and if there are other elements of your record because there's not really as i understand it the restrictions on that so in fact, there, there already has been this massive rise of these, these tech fins there, you know, academics and, and you know, observers are starting to write about it. And you know, I think that type of approach could be coming our way. Yeah. It is it's getting recent. scary, yeah. It is recent. I mean, um, China's had actually the most experience in this. In 2002, people started using QQ coins on uh, Tencent network uh, because they were much more stable than the one, and the Chinese government had to step in to regulate the use of QQ coins. They've had a lot of good experience in that. Sure. Uh, just to, this isn't a question, but this is something that came out of lunch today. Okay, Sub-Saharan Africa, collecting taxes by mobile telephony, revolutionizing for this particular country. I'm not going to name it. I'm not going to identify the individual, but he's here, and it's brilliant. And that is a really profound yeah. social kind of a... But there are cultural factors to that, right? Like. Uh, the ability to, to uh, pay via your phone, uh, which was a technology that was adopted in Africa decades ago, uh, was primarily driven by the fact that if you carried cash, you had a risk of being held up and being robbed, right? Digital wallets aren't seeing the, the adoption rate here that we would expect, you know, M-Pesa had in Africa 15, 20 years ago, because there is no such imperative. Uh, cultural factors affect these separate things. Now, this is an interesting example. I was thinking that when I start, started to go to France the first time in the 70s, the joke that the business people would talk to me was, this is France, you have to understand, and it's part of the national culture not to pay taxes. You don't hear that joke anymore in France. <laughs> A good part of the French NSA is targeted on uh, tax dodgers, and it's not a joking, funny issue anymore. The Frenchman pays his taxes. And that could happen in Spain and Greece and even Italy, OK? Uh, and I could see the EU pushing into that down the road. So that is a huge long tail consequence. Yeah, and actually mentioning that, I mean, in India, they've just undergone yeah. you know, this massive program to Adhar, Adhar to, to you know, using advanced uh, you know, biometric techniques, which are now you know, routine part of every person in India has a cell phone. This has vastly expanded people's access. It began with you know, social services and to prevent corruption, but it has very quickly given all these people an on-ramp to financial services. They have access to cash, to payments. They'll start to develop enough of a history 
not but without problems. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, they, they focused on rolling out identity to 1.3 billion people, including people who are homeless. And they didn't really think about uh, the, the consequences of doing that up front, because if they did that, if they put the constraints before the adoption, then the adoption would fail. Yeah. So now they're going through the evolution of the constraints that they're going to have to put on that system. Yeah. Right. Okay, other comments or questions? Over here. So with the onset of European privacy regulations, do you think there will be businesses that will become non-economic? And how do you think consumers will react when they don't have access to those businesses anymore at their current zero price? It's, it's left to be seen, I think. Um, as with any regulation, some politicians give it some modicum of thought and pass the regulation, and then you iterate on top of that. A GDPR, for example, has carve-outs for uh, KYC, CIP, because Europe kind of leans towards the compliance side, but doesn't have any carve-outs for fraud. That means that certain types of data you can collect to know your customer cannot be collected for actually preventing fraud. So to answer your question of uh, will companies be impacted? Absolutely. Um, there have been you know, uh, lots of companies collecting a lot of information. Uh, ironically, uh, Europe is hypocritical, right? While they have very good privacy regulation, wherever you walk around, if you just stretch your neck and look up, there's a billion cameras watching everything you're doing. So the it's fine for government to collect all that information, not for, for uh, businesses. So the, the, they haven't actually sort of regulated for all kind of eventual use cases. Uh, they've started primarily around uh, kind of uh, consent being the, the central theme. Consumer has to give consent for whatever you collect. And then they've sort of uh, wrapped around existing laws that uh, exist in Europe for a long time now around what kind of data you can store and where you have to store it and so on. Well, then also how you treat it and what you do with That's it, right. what, what you're using it for. So, for example, you talk about the social impacts. It's making sure you're not using for... Um, you know, racial targeting or, or whatever things that would put somebody else at a disadvantage, for example, if you're going for insurance, yep. et cetera. But there, there's also another, another facet of it is, is although it's a Europe-wide regulation that each country, the national competent authority will have a pri sort of privacy czar for each country who will be in charge of overseeing it and also allowing waivers. So what one can expect to happen is, you know, they may want to favor local Spanish businesses or Hungarian businesses or there may be particular challenges. So I think that there will be potential for inconsistencies and maybe even regulatory arbitrage across different countries. And then I will add, so we've had some conversations with some bigger banks in, in Europe, and this was frankly even before GDPR got very big, um, but there is uh, a certain level of accepted surveillance of traders and people doing things at banks, uh, but that was increasingly feeling resistance, and so Basically, the, the, the people who are doing the surveillance in the banks charged with mitigating that risk said, look, I'm just going to say we can't do business in this region, in this country, if you're not going to allow me to do it. And so we'll move from London to wow. some other location where we can do it. Uh, and so you know, I think there's just ongoing tension uh, that, frankly, is, I think, very helpful and, and healthy to do. But it's certainly, people are making real business decisions on what they can do with their data and how they can use it. I'd like to thank our panelists. Let me try to summarize the whole session by saying we need to consider a wider set of scenarios than I thought of before I came up here. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.